Hello. In this video, we're going to be talking our way through a nice question about a carousel as an example of a rotational kinematics problem and taking a look at how it is that we really apply this process that I've been talking about called Greekification, which is just the idea that we can use the linear kinematics equations and apply them to rotational situations um, essentially in the same way that we would want to um, for the linear case. So let's read through the question and then see exactly how that goes. So we start off, we're told we've got a carousel and it's got a 30 second ride that you can um, enjoy. The first five seconds consist of you accelerating from rest at a constant rate of 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.75 sorry, radians per second squared for five seconds. And then just enjoying a steady angular um, velocity for the next 20 seconds and then decelerating in the last five seconds to come back to rest. So using that same magnitude of 0 0.75, but this time with a minus sign to actually slow you down. And then we're asked a bunch of questions. How many times around do we go? And then some other things which we'll come back to. So as I say, this is exactly like a linear problem. Okay, if I replace the, the carousel, say, with a car, and that thing accelerates at some rate for five seconds, then cruises steadily for 20 seconds, and then decelerates for the next five seconds. I think um, most of you would agree that, that as a linear kinematics problem, pretty e easy to solve. I would find the displacement by using my handy and trusty equation that delta x is just some initial velocity times the time that I travel for plus one-half of a t squared, whatever that acceleration is that I've given this car. So how do we go ahead and apply that to this? So the secret is our x becomes theta. That's going to be our angular displacement. Our v becomes our omega. And our a becomes alpha. So those are all of the angular equivalents of the linear kinematics variables. Theta is our angular position, and therefore delta theta is our angular displacement. Omega is our angular velocity, and alpha is our angular acceleration. So with these things in mind, um, we can almost already answer the first question. First question is going to be, how many times does it go around? Well, we'll have an angular displacement if we can solve this part of the problem. But the number of times around, well, if I know the total angle that I've gone through, and I know that every single time around corresponds to 360 degrees, which is in fact just 2 pi radians, then I can simply write that n is just going to be that total angular displacement divided by the 2 pi radians that I get for every single time around. So n then will be the number of times that I've gone around. So that's a great plan of attack. And then we have to look at the details of the motion. So these are only true if you're talking about constant uniform acceleration. And if we talk about accelerating, going steadily at the same rate, and then decelerating, that's clearly not constant. But each of those three pieces individually is. So that's what we'll do. We'll talk about the first part of the motion. So we'll call that delta theta 1. And that's when you accelerate from rest, so you have no velocity angular or otherwise, and you're accelerating, and I'm just going to leave alpha as alpha to save me writing 0 0.75 all the time, but the time here is 5 seconds, so I have to square that. So that one just becomes um, 25 alpha on 2. All right, so then the second part of our motion, and here we run into a little bit of trouble, because we now need to make a little detour and figure out the initial uh, velocity for this part of the motion. But the initial velocity for this part of the motion is the final velocity from the part where we accelerated. Now, again, if we make an analogy to a car, we know that we could write down something like delta v is equal to a times t. Using that, we can write down simply that delta omega our angular velocity and, well, our change in the angular velocity is 
just alpha times t. Okay, so that's good. That's saying our final velocity after accelerating minus our initial velocity is alpha times t. The angular acceleration times the time that we actually accelerate for. So, of course, we can write omega f is equal to alpha t if we're talking about accelerating from rest because then omega zero is just zero. And voila, that is the answer for this part of the question because we were, in fact, accelerating from rest. We were accelerating for five seconds, so you can write five alpha. So that is the final angular velocity after accelerating for five seconds, which is properly the initial velocity that we have when we start our motion, our steady cruising along the carousel for 20 seconds. So the time for that angular velocity is 20. I'm now I'm just going back to filling in this kind of equation. So that was omega naught for the second part is 5 alpha. T is 20 seconds. And then no acceleration for that last bit. And then there's the third part of our motion. That also is moving with that same speed, right? Nothing has changed. The initial speed when I begin to decelerate is the same speed that I've been cruising along with the whole time. So again, I've got this five alpha. I'm gonna decelerate over five seconds. And then I've got to add in the fact that I'm actually accelerating this time. Now this time I'm accelerating, but with a minus sign for my alpha. And that's five squared again. So that looks pretty good. We now know um, the individual angular displacements for each part of our motion. And if I want the total, then I really just take a total. So I'll add all these up. So if I look at this one, this is actually 25 onto alpha squared with a negative sign. When I add it, to my positive signed 25 on 2 alpha, those bits will cancel. So I've got here 25 alpha and 100 alpha. So my total delta theta, which is the sum of those three, gives me 125 alpha. Which then means if I want n, well that's supposed to be delta theta on 2 pi. So if I look at that, and just divide that by 2 pi. And then if I substitute in 0 0.75 for alpha and I put in the value of pi and do some math, then what I will find is that that's approximately 15 times around. So that's pretty reasonable. We're not like whirling around this thing and making a, a thousand revolutions um, in 30 seconds. And we're not going terribly slowly. so. We're not exactly being, um, you know, ripped off by the ride or anything. So that seems a reasonable sort of value. So then we'll go ahead and continue with that. Now, the next part says, looking at the picture, the horses are clearly flying off of the carousel. So suppose that actually were happening. If that really did occur, then how fast would those horses be moving in a straight line? Because once they come off, they continue moving in a straight line. As we know from Newton's laws, there's no more forces. if They're not connected to the carousel. So they'll just keep moving in that straight line. So in order to do this, we appeal to another nice trick. And that is that any time that you are moving in circular motion with some angular velocity or even some angular acceleration, as long as you're moving in this nice circle, then you can figure out the tangential component of velocity and of acceleration, so these are the linear equivalents to your angular motion, just by multiplying by the radius. So in the case of velocity, we just mean r times omega. And we're asked about when they're moving the fastest. And when they're moving the fastest is after they've finished accelerating for five seconds, because after that, they're just going and keeping that speed and then slowing down. So this omega that we found is already the value of omega that we want. So the radius is two meters. Omega is five alpha, 
But remember that that 5 came from the time here. So that has a unit on it of seconds. So we've got 5, make that look a bit more like a 5, 5 a second times alpha times 2 meters. So that gives us 10 alpha meter seconds. And alpha is 0 0.75 radians per second squared. So times 10 gives us 7.5 radians meters per second. Because the per second squared cancels with the one second up top and leaves us with a per second overall. Now that may look a bit funny, but this is, highlights one other important part of discussing rotational kinematics, which is that actually radian is dimensionless. Meter is, has dimensions of length. Seconds has dimensions of time. Uh, kilogram has dimensions of mass. But a radian is a measure of an angle, and that doesn't carry with it any dimensions. So even though we have officially gotten 7.5 radians meters per second, that's just the same as simply getting rid of that radian because it's dimensionless. So that's just 7.5 meters per second. And lastly, we want to know something about the acceleration for our horses not to fly off the carousel. So if we actually want our carousel ride to continue um, without horses flying off and people being whisked away from the ride itself, then we need to ensure that we are giving an acceleration towards the center of our circular motion. Because at that point, we are considering uniform um, circular motion. So in the part where we're coasting along with this nice um, 20 seconds of steady riding, that part is uniform circular motion. So what do we do? Well, in the lectures, we've discussed and shown by thinking about forces and things, we've actually shown it, that the acceleration that you need in order to move in some circle of radius r at some speed v is just v squared on r. And so we can go ahead and do that one. So you can put in 7.5 um, meters per second squared on 2 meter radius. So 7.5 squared is going to be a bit tricky to do in our heads, but we know that 7 squared is 49, 8 squared is 64, and 7.5 is somewhere in between. So let's roughly estimate 56. That's between 49 and 64. And divide by 2, so that one's meters. And we have to be careful. We've squared the number. We need to square the units with it. So that gives us meters squared, seconds squared. And then notice that those units work, because one meter cancels with the other. So we get 28 uh, meters per second squared, which are correct units for acceleration. And by including the units, we've provided ourselves with a nice check of exactly, um, you know, do we have any hope of being right? Because if we get the wrong units, then clearly we've plugged in the wrong value somewhere or used an incorrect formula. So that's a useful check. So to sum up, the key ideas that we've used in this question were the mapping between linear and rotational, just knowing that x turns into theta, v turns into omega, a turns into alpha, and so constant linear acceleration gave you that equation, then constant angular acceleration gives you that one with all the angles. We also used the fact that we can map between linear and rotational quantities in this way to get the tangential component of those motions. So the tangential velocity, which is a straight line velocity um, at some instant where you're moving with angular speed omega, is just r times omega. And lastly, we made use of this fact, which is just the acceleration required for uniform um, circular motion with velocity v and radius r. Right, so hopefully um, that was helpful and has cleared up some of the questions about rotational kinematics. And in other videos, we'll address other questions.